So just to introduce myself, I'm uh, Professor Julia Black. I'm Interim Director here at the LSE, and I'm also Pro-Director for Research. And um, to add to all the hats, I'm also a professor in the Law Department. So I have absolutely no uh, academic background at all uh, in the talk which is about to come, other than um, just absolute uh, passionate interest. And it is with huge pleasure, as I say, to introduce um, Dr. Yana Huha, who is here as a Marie Curie um, Fellow. Marie Curie scheme, for those of you who don't know, is a highly prestigious uh, fellowship scheme, um, uh, highly competitive, issued by the European Research Council. And um, you can always, they are a real testament to somebody's academic achievements, actually, to really have a Marie Curie Fellowship. So we're absolutely delighted that Jana's been here working with us, and she's been in the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Sciences. Um, and her work is, is truly interdisciplinary. It cuts across psychology, biology, social sciences, philosophy of science. And what she really looks at is um, individuals and how you can explore behaviors and identities from transdisciplinary viewpoints. And she's won a number of prizes, et cetera, uh, for her work and uh, for addressing fundamental research problems and for really promoting collaborative research. And she, I mean, she'll obviously be talking this evening, but her research looks at individuals and their personalities, not just through questionnaires, but through behavioral approaches. And I think it's quite fascinating as well that she's observed not only people, but worked with primates as well, um, looking at how we perceive individuals and how we judge their personality and how that's related to how individuals are actually behaving. So a lot of this is quite complex multi-method studies using computerization, video-based behavioral measurements, standardized and open-ended open surveys, in-depth interviews, first-person videos, et cetera, et cetera. And really what she's fundamentally concerned with is the impact of stereotypical biases that we have, usually unconscious, of our judgments of individuals, and therefore how we're interacting and behaving with them. And so tonight she's going to present some of her latest research that she's been conducting while she's been here at the LSE and when she's applied evidence-based methods to explore the pathways by which those unintentional biases related to gender and ethnicity influence our judgments on other people's personality. So this is a, this is a really fundamental core issue um, for, for all of us in the way that we interact, we make judgments, we make career appointments, we promote people, um, et cetera. We make friends with them. So, just got to do some housekeeping on the social media side of things. So the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Psychology. Got it up there. Um, obviously, can you please put your phones on silent? Um, the event is being recorded, so ho and hopefully will be made available as a podcast. I will be asking quest taking questions from the audience at the end. Um, and I usually do ask you to give your name and your affiliation, but obviously as we're being recorded and you prefer not to do that, then that will be absolutely fine. Okay, so it was great pleasure to say to introduce Yana um, and look forward to her talk tonight. Thank you. Many thanks, Julia, for this most kind introduction, for supporting this research and for chairing this event tonight. Thank you all for coming to this lecture at this important day for the United Kingdom. And a particular warm welcome to all of you who have participated in my research and to all of my colleagues and friends at LSE who have supported me in one way or another. I also thank the European Commission who is funding this research through the Marie Curie program. The topic of tonight's lecture is differences between individuals, differences that are real and differences that are just in our minds. And I'm going to explore with you the complex relations between both. Okay. Nobody denies that differences exist between individuals and between groups of people. There are numerous ways in which people look different. As adults, we differ in the height and shape of our bodies and the color of our eyes, hair and skin. All this is directly apparent at first glance and goes unquestioned. But these visible differences, most likely because they are so easy to spot, are also often used to make assumptions about many other attributes of people that are not visible at first glance, 
such as about their behaviors, minds, and personality. Identifying individual differences in behavior, mind, and personality is much more complicated than spotting others' bodily properties from a distance. It requires repeated observation and requires people to get in touch, to listen, and to talk. To navigate through our complex social worlds, we humans have developed particular strategies that help us differentiate between people in efficient ways and to quickly form impressions of others. One important strategy is communication. Knowledge about people plays an essential role in everyday life. Therefore, our everyday language contains numerous words that we can use to efficiently communicate complex information about individuals. We intuitively use this knowledge to form impression of others and to develop ideas of how they may behave towards us. And these first impressions, however accurate, provide a sense of security and predictability in dealing with others. And they offer cues by which we can adjust our interactions with others. And this allows us to mentally handle this com the complex social world in efficient ways. But this efficiency comes at the price. It comes at the expense of accuracy. In our increasingly multicultural and multi-ethnic societies, rapid formation of impression on the basis of just a few easy to spot cues in individuals' bodies inevitably entail stereotypical biases and discrimination. Most of us are fully aware that prejudice and stereotypes exist and can have real consequences for people's lives. Many of us have also experienced such, such consequences ourselves. But despite this, and even if we may sincerely prejudiced, reject prejudiced ideas and may not even believe that particular stereotypes are true, it is still possible that they influence our behaviors and actions in prejudiced ways. This is called unintentional bias, also implicit or unconscious bias. Many people believe they are not prejudiced. It's just something some other people do. But we all have prejudices. People of all ethnicities and all social, cultural and educational backgrounds hold prejudices. Over the last decade, thousands of studies have demonstrated stereotypical bias across almost every field. Biases about others' competencies, skills and behaviours are held on the basis of attributes that are therefore completely irrelevant, such as gender, skin colour, hair colour, body weight, religion, sexual orientation and parental status, to name just a few. Universities tend to view themselves and position themselves as highly liberal places in which stereotypical beliefs are countered with scientific knowledge. But academia is not free from of them. By contrast, some stereotypical biases still held in our ivory towers are quite pronounced. Such biases are not just inappropriate inconveniences. They have important and often pronounced impact for people's lives. In the UK's higher education institutions, for example, women make up almost half of the non-professorial academic staff, but are only less than 20% of the professoriate. Moreover, female professors earn on average more than 6% less than their male counterparts. Black and minority ethnic academics make up 13% of the non-professorial academic staff, but only about 7% of the professoriate. Of the about 18,500 professors in the United Kingdom, only 85 are of black ethnicity, among them only 17 women. On average, black professors earn more than 9% less than their white counterparts. There are thousands of studies showing that if one person is white and another black, and if one person is a woman and another a man, they will be treated differently for no other reason than that their ethnic and gender identities have a cultural meaning. And that cultural meaning colors the way in which we see people. Since the 1990s, researchers have been trying to wipe out unintentional biases. A great many of trainings have been developed in universities, organizations, and companies. The effects of some of these programs are well documented, but many others have yet to be evaluated. These trainings could have literally any effect on people. And in fact, some diversity trainings have even decreased the likelihood of black men and women to advance in their organizations. So intentions aren't good enough. 
Moreover, many people still regard the concept of unintentional bias as old-fashioned bigotry. Others believe its role in affecting people is overstated or they just don't perceive its existence. And in fact, people with different identities often perceive different realities. Majority people often see only intentional acts of discrimination, whereas my, my minority people may also notice the unintended and subtle ones. We always see the world only from our own particular perspective, and adopting others' perspective is not always easy. One challenge to bridging these perspectives is that real life rarely provides the necessary conditions to evidence these biases. In my public lecture tonight, I will present some key findings from my Marie Curie research here at LSE, in which I have applied evidence-based approaches to explore stereotypical biases in our judgments of individuals, focusing on judgments of personality. So far, personality differences have largely been studied with questionnaires. Findings from questionnaire studies regularly reflect differences between people of different gender and ethnicity. But it is still largely unknown in what ways personality ratings reflect differences that can actually be, be observed in everyday life behaviors and in which ways they are biased by stereotypical beliefs. A, particular, uh, a po popular belief, for example, is that women are more talkative than men. But when researchers recorded natural conversations of people using variable devices, they found large individual differences in the number of words spoken per day. But women did not talk more than men. A large number of studies have shown that males and females are similar on most, but not all, psychological variables. That is, men and women, as well as boys and girls, are more alike than they are different. If we plot women's scores in a particular ability or personality characteristic on the bottom axis, we may find that only a few women are located at the two extremes, and most are somewhere in the middle. For men, we may find a similar distribution. The question of gender differences now concerns the amount of overlap in their score distributions. Popular beliefs often see these two populations as being located quite far away from one another. But in reality, there is considerable overlap. This is the mean difference between men and women found in many psychological studies. In each gender, there are tremendous individual differences. There are still so even if uh, in abilities in which, on average, men are scoring higher than women, there are still many women scoring higher than many men. Such small differences do not allow straightforward conclusions about individual case cases. But in everyday life, we tend to ignore the many ways in which individuals are highly similar to another. Instead, we put on our mental magnifying glasses and exaggerate minor differences between them. And this can become problematic in making judgments of people and their personality. Personality questionnaires are quite popular. They are considered an efficient means of standardized inquiry that enable accurate comparisons between individuals. Therefore, questionnaire scales are widely used in research and applied settings, such as for personal selection and development, and thus also to make decisions about people's careers. More than a decade ago, I was working in the British headquarters of an international steel company in human resources management. My task was to set up a development process for the middle managers to prepare them for upcoming changes in the international steel business. This also involved a personality assessment. A licensed assess assessor was brought in who let the managers fill in a questionnaire and then fed back the results to them individually. And after this, one of the managers came to me Pointing to his personality report, he said to me, Jana, that's not me. And he was deeply concerned, in particular, because his report has also been given to the top management to make decisions about his future career progression. This report was based on his own self-assessment on that questionnaire. So how could it be so different from the views that he held on himself? Given the importance placed on personality assessments and research, and applied fields and the increasing criticism on personality, on, on questionnaire methods in psychology, I started to explore how people actually understand questionnaires and how they generate their answers on rating scales. 
In my LSE research, I wanted to know what roles questionnaires play in the manifestation of unintentional biases in personality assessments, focusing on gender and ethnicity. For personality testing, the internet has become an important setting as it enables efficient administration and collection of data. And therefore, I conducted an online study to explore how people judge others' personality on the basis of observable behaviors, I conducted a video study in which I interviewed participants about the protagonist in a film. I'm going to present you some key findings of these two studies. But first of all, I would like to thank all of you who have participated in this research. I know that answering my questions about what specifically you have considered in your judgments was a lot of mental work and for many also a journey of self-discovery about your own habits of judging others. I thank you all wholeheartedly for your efforts, all those who came to the LSE for an interview and whom I had the pleasure to meet in person, and all the many others who participated in the online study. In both studies, I have used one of the most widely used personality questionnaire developed in psychology, a Big Five inventory, focusing on four factors, extraversion, neuroticism, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. Each factor is assessed with two items intended to capture its opposite poles. Extraversion, for example, is assessed with is outgoing sociable as the high pole and is reserved as the low pole. Neuroticism, which describes emotional stability, or better to say instability, is assessed with gets nervous easily and is relaxed, handles stress well. For each statement, raters can indicate their agreement on a five-point rating scale, from strongly disagree to strongly agree. In the online study, I first asked people to rate an unknown person in photo and describe what they had considered when making their judgments. Photos of people play an important role in everyday life. We present photos of our faces everywhere. They are in our websites and our social media profiles, an important one of them being Facebook. The photo I presented was rather small. I minimized it to just two to three centimeters. It portrayed only the face without any particular facial expression, like a passport photo. And importantly, every participant saw just one photo. For all personality terms, I asked them to judge. But I had four different versions of this survey each of which showed the photo of another person, a black woman, a black man, a white woman, and a white man. Participants didn't know anything about the portrayed persons, and I asked them to judge how sociable, nervous, trusting, or lazy these persons were. For every single personality item, about 20 to 30% of the participants complained that such a judgment cannot be made. They wrote, for example, I have no way of knowing from a photo how this person would react in social situations. This is impossible to tell from this picture. I can't judge if somebody is outgoing and sociable from a picture like this. The expression is too neutral. Another one wrote, I might be, he might be outgoing and sociable, but I can't tell from this photo. He looks like, like he's posing for this picture and looks serious in the photo. He could be very sociable and outgoing, when he's out of this pose. Another one wrote, as she appears to be dressed in work clothes, this is hard to judge. If I could see her in her own clothes, I would feel more comfortable making any kind of guess about this. I wholeheartedly agree with this. To judge others' personality, we need to know about them, see them in various situations, hear them talk, and interact with them. But I didn't provide any information about this. I just presented these photos. The only information I wanted participants to take from these small photos was information about these persons' gender and ethnicity. Some also commented on the person's age, which was the same for all of them, and on their clothes. They all wore business clothes. But there was really not much else to see in these small photos, and this was reflected in the participants' responses. Judgments of personality reflect what we perceive in the target person, thus what we pay attention to in others. But these perceptions are colored by our interpretations of the cues we perceive. Our perceptions and interpretations merge together in our judgments. In my study, I reduced the perceivable information to just a few visual cues in these small photos that are largely uninformative about the personality characteristics in question. 
This means that participants had to rely on their ideas and everyday knowledge about people, and this is what I wanted to study. So, with a lack of any specific information about the target person's behaviours, participants should have selected neither agree or disagree with the statement. But many people may also like to rate strangers more favourably in terms of what may be socially um, more valued. After all, why should we attribute something negative to others? And finally, people may also just guess or select randomly. The lack of information about the target person is reflected in the lack of agreement between raters. It was ways below chance level. This reflects that raters were just generating, uh, generating ideas about how the target person might be. We, also see, we see this also in the frequencies by which the answer categories were chosen, here for outgoing sociable. I'm using stereotypical colors to capitalize on your knowledge of gendered color choices in our society. So red indicates the results for women, blue for the man, and those with white stripes indicate the results for the white people. The ratings provided for each person varied greatly. But despite this, some tendencies emerged in the average ratings. In outgoing sociable, for example, the white man received the highest average rating, followed by the black man. But the average rating of the white woman and the black man were below the neutral <coughs> middle. He indicated with a bold line, with the, man, with the black man scoring the lowest. So people's tendencies to rate an unknown person more favorably differed by the target person's intersection of gender and ethnicity. The brackets indicate the differences that were statistically meaningful. The magnitude of these differences is substantial. It is about three to five times higher than the average gender differences found in many psychological studies. <coughs> Differences in personality attribution also occurred in the other questionnaire statements. The white man, for example, was rated less, uh, as less reserved than the black man and the white woman. Ratings of gets nervous easily very strongly for all four per persons. So the differences here may be more random. Whereas in relaxed handle stress, well, the white man scored higher than the white woman. The black man, the black woman was rated as generally more trusting than the others, whereas the white woman was ascribed a much higher tendency to find fault with others. But she was rated as doing a more thorough job than the white man, who was rated as more lazy than all the others. <laughs> Thus, although many raters correctly stated that one cannot judge a person's personality just from a neutral photo, some of their personality attributions varied considerably at various intersections of gender and ethnicity. Some of these scores reflect gender differences reported repeatedly in judgments of known persons, such as that women are considered to be more neurotic than men. But the gender differences attributed to the photos also differed between the ethnicity. In fact, across countries, gender differences in rating studies have varied substantially. They are, these are results of gender differences in Big Five ratings in the UK, here in black, and some neighboring countries in France, in purple, in the Netherlands, in green, in Germany, in yellow, and Finland, in blue. The bold line indicates the average small gender difference found across many psychological attributes in which male and female populations strongly overlap. In extraversion, virtually no gender differences at all occurred in the United Kingdom and the Netherlands. In Germany and Finland, there were only small differences, and in Finland, in the opposite direction. Only in France, where gender differences are a bit more pronounced. In all four, five countries, women were rated as more neurotic than men, but the magnitude of these differences was only moderate and varied across countries. Substantial differences across countries also occurred in agreeableness and conscientiousness. Now, how does this come about? Gender differences are commonly attributed to women's and men's different underlying biology. But the biology between people of these neighboring countries does not differ in any ways that could explain these, these enormous differences. So all these differences must derive from cultural and language differences. And this shows that there are no, no universal differences in which men and women differ profoundly. Rather, it is our views and the social cultural beliefs we hold about them. And it is these different views that we take on individuals through our social cultural lenses that are at the center of my studies. 
Therefore, I asked participants to describe what they had considered in their ratings and how they made their choices. The explanations fell into various categories. 43% of the raters mentioned something they had picked up from the facial expressions. Some wrote the person is smiling and looks straight into the camera, indicating the person is quite outgoing sociable. But others wrote the face is not very expressive and the person does not smile and therefore appears to be not very outgoing sociable. Interestingly, these opposite comments were made about the same photo. Thus, the lack of information about these persons and their inexpressive faces left a lot of room for interpretation that participants filled with their different views on people. Almost 20% wrote the person in photo looked either confident, easygoing and relaxed and might therefore be outgoing sociable, or tensed and not relaxed and might therefore be not outgoing sociable. Cues of high and low sociability were also mentioned for most of the other categories, such as whether or not the person looked like being friendly, approachable, socially competent, easy to talk to, or having a wide social circus, circle and enjoying parties. 19% commented on the business clothes, which for some indicated the person can hold a job and thus must have at least minimal social competence, whereas for others these clothes indicated a rigid stereotype and thus a reserved person. Some of these comments referred to cues that were directly visible in the photo, although interpreted very differently. But many comments clearly referred to behaviors that were not directly visible in the photos and that people only associated with them. The answers, these answers provide a window into how raters form impressions of others on the basis of just a few visible cues and their general knowledge about people. One participant described this nicely in her explanation of her rating of gets nervous easily. The thing with the survey is that I have kind of started to give this person a fully fledged identity and personality. Like reading a novel and getting immersed into a character, it is hard to change my viewpoints now. I don't think he gets nervous easily because he is a relaxed person and doesn't get stressed out easily. Thus, because she had previously rated him as relaxed, she now adapted her other ratings according, accordingly to develop for herself a rounded image of this unknown person that was in line with her general beliefs about personality differences. But that need not have anything to do with how this person actually is. Participants considered cues indicating high or low sociability differently depending upon the target person. For the black man, they had significantly fewer ideas in their minds about why he might be sociable than for the three others. But participants mentioned significantly more ideas about why he may be not sociable. <coughs> the white woman received a substantial and equal number of comments about, about why she might or might not be sociable. Whereas for the white man, participants had far more ideas in their mind why he might be sociable than he might not be. For the black woman, the results are very similar. I will come to this maybe surprising finding a bit later. Thus, participants considered cues indicating that the person might or might not be sociable very differently, depending upon the intersection of the target person's gender and ethnicity. This is a first pathway by which unintentional biases can influence personality judgments. Now, how are the cues that raters considered related to the ratings they made in the scales? Generally, the more cues for high sociability raters considered for a person, the higher should the ratings of that person's sociability be, here indicated with a purple bar. Vice versa, the more cues for low sociability raters had in mind, the lower their sociability raters should, ratings should be, here indicated with a green bar. This was the case for all four target persons. But for the white man, cues indicating high sociability were given more weight in the ratings than this was the case for the three others. And this, although for the black woman, raters considered an equal number of cues indicating high sociability like for the white man. But vice versa, cues indicating low sociability did not influence the white man's rating that much, as was the case for the three others, in which such considerations influenced their ratings quite strongly. Here we are talking about what people pay attention to in order to inform their ratings. And we clearly see that people weighted the considered pieces of evidence differently for the white man than for the three others. 
This is one of several instances reflecting the frequent notion of the white man's privileged status and the very subtle pathways through which his status influences people's judgments. Then I wanted to know how participants interpreted the personality terms in the questionnaire I'd used, and if this may differ by the target person's gender and ethnicity. And therefore I asked them to describe how they would expect the person in photo to behave if he or she is judged to be very, for example, very outgoing, sociable. More than 57% wrote outgoing, sociable persons have an active social life and many friends. 85% reported on social contact behavior such as smiling, being expressive, loud, and the attention getter, initiating contact, being talkative, friendly, and interested in others. 24% wrote, very outgoing sociable persons are confident and easygoing. Further 24% they are interesting and open to new experiences. About 7% mentioned negative behaviors such as being opinionated, a bit obnoxious, overbearing, impulsive, and not so reflective. On average, each rater mentioned behaviors of just two of these categories. Thus, different raters focused on very different aspects that outgoing sociable can generally have. And they did so also with regard to the four different target persons. In the graphic, scores further to the right mean the behaviors were mentioned more often and scores more to the left mean they were mentioned less often. We see that raters tended to think of very outgoing sociable persons in terms of seeking out others and having a wider circle, more often with regard to white people than to black people for whom in turn initiating contact, being expressive, friendly, loud and attention getters was mentioned more often. Aspects of confidence, being interested, were mentioned more often for white people than for blacks. And then seemed to appear an interesting gender gap. Participants mentioned for women more often than for men the word extra word and negative aspects of highly sociable persons such as being overbearing, a bit obnoxious, impulsive and not so reflective. I don't want to overinterpret these differences. With a few exceptions, many are statistically very small. But these slight differences to interpret personality terms differently with regard to people of different gender and ethnicity may contribute small elements that in their entirety may amount to manifest stereotypical biases in everyday life, resulting in different attributions of personality even to unknown persons of whom not much is apparent other than their gender, ethnicity, a business dress, and a rather neutral facial expression. And in fact, people who knew these four persons in video and photo from real life rated them very differently. Their peer ratings and those of the participants showed no agreement at all. The online study has highlighted subtle pathways by which stereotypical beliefs can <coughs> impact judgments of others' personality. We have seen that sometimes people tend to interpret visible cues in the photos differently, to weigh this information differently, and also to interpret the personality terms slightly differently, depending upon the gender and ethnicity of the target person. Now, photos are important for us, but to form impressions of personality, we mostly consider others' behaviors. And therefore, I produced a short film about a protagonist who shows various behaviors in different scenes that the participants could observe and then rate the protagonist's personality. Here again, I had four identical versions in which the persons in the photos played the role of the protagonist, an executive sales co director called Ashley. In three scenes, Ashley showed different behaviors. First, Ashley received a phone call from the boss informing about an important project that Ashley has to take over with a tight deadline. Ashley informed staff member Leone, adopting a more communal leadership style. In scene two, Ashley is checking in three days before the deadline to find out that some things are going wrong and then shows a more agentic and dominant leadership style. In scene three, one day before deadline, the project seems to be on a good track and Ashley shows elements of both leadership styles. So overall, the behaviors visible in the film are very diverse and inconsistent across the different scenes, leaving a lot of room for interpretation. Now I would like to show you these videos. In particular, I would like to show you that the four Ashleys have done and said the same thing. 
I will therefore play these videos in parallel with a slight temporal delay. I'm not sure whether that works out acoustically in, in the theater. T technically, it does. <laughs> if it is too painful for your ears, please do signal that, and I will stop it. Okay, I think that is sufficient for an impression. <laughs> Exploring thought processes is highly complex. As soon as we start to think about what we are just thinking, the thoughts under consideration change and eventually disappear, thus evading closer introspect inspection. <coughs> to overcome these problems, I have used a cutting-edge interview technique used here at LSE that involves first-person videos. In a first step, Participants wore, at eye level, miniature cameras that captured the visual field in front of them, thus their own views on the rating scales, their own rating activities on the scales, and the film they were just watching. In the second step, the participants and I jointly watched their first-person videos, and we discussed their views on the of the protagonists and their ratings. Reviewing one's own first-person video provides detailed audiovisual cues that activate episodic memory. And this technique allows complex thought processes to be explored after the fact, and thus without disturbing them, as would have been the case had asked participants to explain their judgments while they were making them. The interviews took place in pairs of colleagues or friends to study not only each individual's subjective view, but also their intersubjective view, thus our socially shared views on people. But these discussions also helped to carve out differences that people considered. In these interviews, participants searched in their own first-person videos for the moments in which they made a particular rating. And this helped them tremendously to reconstruct what they had considered in the film and what they had in mind when generating the ratings. i show you an example of one of these first-person videos. So looking at this video, for example, we would have discussed the ratings that this person makes. So here we would have discussed why she first thought about selecting the middle category, then agree, and eventually ticked disagree. Looking at this video here for you may not be very enlightening because it is not your first person video. But for those of you who have just seen Ashley in the film and judged his or her personality, seeing the own rating activities again from the own viewpoint and the audiovisual context in which they occurred brought back a lot in their, to their minds a lot of thoughts they had in the moments captured on film. There were only eight personality ratings, but we discussed about them for an hour and an hour and a half. Participants reported about so many things they had considered, and this took a lot of time to verbalize. And this shows how complex our thought processes are even those occurring in just a few moments. 
For most participants, this was also a fun -like exercise because in these videos, you see how much we are moving our heads around and where we are looking at without normally noticing it. And one participant found this even an almost therapeutic technique. She said, this is a great technique because I can watch myself how I'm doing things. And I can see I'm making my judgments too fast and then change them again. I know I often judge people too quickly and then realize only later I was wrong. But with this method, I don't need a doctor to tell me. I can see it myself and can think about it when watching my video. And someone else said, I wish I could review some moments also in everyday life again and think again about the judgments I've made. So this interview technique stimulates a lot of self-reflections about our own thinking. And in the interviews, I asked participants how they had made their ratings, what evidence they had considered in the films, why they ticked a particular answer box, and what the given personality term generally means for them. As in the online study, participants rated the four protagonists sometimes differently. I don't want to go into the details here, but focus on the explanations that the participants provided for the ratings. Let's look again at outgoing social. Participants considered very different pieces of evidence in the just four minute film clip. Here's an overview of the behavioral cues to which they paid attention. Compared to the photos, the films provided far more material to comment on. Moreover, the behavioral cues presented were very heterogeneous. Just as in everyday life, people do not behave the same every day. So for example, Ashley showed concern for his team in scene one, but not in scene two. On average, each participant considered behavioral cues from just three to four of these categories. Thus again, different raters focused on different behavioral cues. And they also did so with regard to the four different protagonists. In the film, participants considered many cues for high sociability in all four Ashleys, and this time, even slightly more for the black man. And this differs from the considerations of the online participants who have rated a photo of him. Moreover, with regard to the black man, participants did not pay overly attention to cues of low sociability. Similarly, for the black woman, 55% of the participants did not mention anything that could indicate low sociability. For the white woman, by contrast, participants again paid attention to an equal number of cues indicating high sociability and cues indicating low sociability. For her, 35% did not mention anything indicating high sociability. Thus the views on her were again more critical. So in the two black Ashleys, many participants paid more attention to socially valued behaviors than the socially less valued behaviors. Many of those con considering the black, black Ashleys more favorably said that they were surprised to see a black person in this job role and that they know how hard it is for them to, re to get into such a position. And that means they must have really achieved a lot. Then I analyzed again how raters weighted these behavioral cues in their ratings. Raters of the black men weighted high sociability cues more strongly than raters of the three other persons. The least weight was given to such cues in the ratings of the white woman. At the same time, cues of low sociability were weighted more strongly in her ratings than in the ratings of the white man and the black woman. But for the black man, they were given even more weight. Thus, with regard to the black man in this particular job role, participants seem to have been polarized. Some raters focused overly on the socially more valued cues of high sociability, weighted these more strongly, and therefore gave him a more favorable rating. Whereas others focused more strongly on cues of low sociability, also weighted these more strongly, and rated him much less favorably than was the case for the others. So in the video study as well, raters tended to focus on different behavioral cues and also tended to weigh them differently depending upon the target person. Raters also tended to interpret the personality terms differently in some cases, which I do not show here now. Thus, the video study as well revealed subtle pathways by which stereotypical biases can influence our judgments of others. Many of the differences I have shown are just small and we should not overinterpret all variations that emerged in the data. But in the complex mental processes involved, even small differences can amount to larger differences in judgments of others that have nothing to do with their personality, 
but only with the rater's beliefs about gender and ethnicity. Interestingly, when judging the four persons in, the particular, in this particular job role, some raters introduced bias deliberately in recognition of the implication that other stereotypical biases have on some people in our society. These are not unintentional, but intentional biases. Many commented on the overprivileged status commonly ascribed to white men, which showed up here in the stronger focus on socially more valued behaviors and the greater weight they were given in the ratings, as well as the much lower focus on socially less valued behaviors and the weight given to them in the ratings. But also in the underprivileged status sometimes attributed to black men, it influenced raters' judgments in various ways, through the stronger consideration of socially less valued behaviors and the higher impact this had on the ratings of the persons in photo, but also in some participants' more favorable considerations and ratings of the black man in the film. Participants explicitly recognized that, given the well-known biases and the implications these have on people's career progression, people belonging to different minority groups, such as black men and women, must have achieved a lot to reach such a position, and therefore rated them intentionally more positively. But in that intention to compensate for existing inequalities, Raters introduced further biases that in turn are noticed by others. Such biases are also used negatively in the pertinent debates, such as contributing to the idea some people would play only the race card or the women card, especially when they are in positions in which their particular identity group is still in the minority. Moreover, some white men are fully aware of the privileged status they are ascribed in our society and the biases entailed for others but also feel discriminated by always being considered the source of these inequalities. As one white male participant stated, it's like, well, okay, hands up, I'm a middle-class white man. Do you want me to apologize now? Sorry, I try my best for everyone every day, but I'm the group that you think is causing a problem. In one sense, this is almost reverse discrimination. You are saying I'm the problem, I'm not the problem. And in fact, in the online study, the white man was rated as doing a much less thorough job and as being more lazy. And likely, this could have also derived from an intentional bias, because some participants of the video study explicitly said that men, white men get into such positions only because of their privileged status and not because of their achievements. And this is an important point. The intention to compensate for known inequalities by rating people of some minority groups in some contexts more favorably has clear downsides as well. We all want to be judged on the basis of our achievements and our behaviors, and not because we fill the statistics for a group of people that are still in the minority in particular jobs. And this shows that stereotypical biases are highly complex and affect not only people from minority groups, but also people from the majority group. I'm convinced that whenever we ask people to judge others' faces and behaviors and to interpret personality terms, variations will occur that have nothing to do with the person under assessment, but solely with the persons who are making the judgments and with their particular beliefs and views on people. The findings I have presented are attributions made by my participants, which in both studies were Londoners of various age groups. About 70% of them were women. Over 30% of them hold a bachelor degree, 31% a master degree, and 10% a PhD. So these were quite educated samples. Of particular interest to better understand the views they expressed in my studies certainly is their ethnic identity. This is how participants identified themselves using the ethnicity categories from the London census. The largest group identified themselves as white British, almost the same percentage as white other. Then there was a larger group of Asian or Asian British people and also of Chinese people that in the London census system are listed under, not under Asian, but under other ethnic groups. So the views reflected in my findings likely reflect views held primarily by white women and to some extent also by Asian women. And this highlights one important and well-known fact. Stereotypical biases occur with regard to the person under judgment, not to those who are making the judgments. Thus, prejudices are held not only by people in the majority group, but by everyone. It is not only white men who are more critical of female leaders, but also women themselves. Quite many of my participants said, I'm a woman, I can put myself in her shoes, and I would not behave like that. 
So I can judge that. And this may explain why in, in my studies, the white woman often received an equal number of favorable and less favorable comments. So people seem generally to comment a lot on white women in leadership roles. I'm mentioning the ethnic, ethnic identity of my participants only now, because I have studied not only how people categorize others using personality questionnaires, but also how they fit their own ethnic identity into the fixed categories widely used, such as these ones here used in the London census. Participants reported about many inadequacies of these categories and the difficulties many of them encounter when asked to indicate their own ethnic identity in such scheme. Those who ticked white British made that tick quite quickly and referred to their family origin and British passport. White Irish people also made their ticks quite quickly and said they are proud of their nationality. One Irish person, however, mentioned that this box formerly was the second class category. The others needed much longer to, take, to make their choice and their stories were very complex. Some people were born in the UK, hold a British passport, but spent most of their life in Australia and identified themselves as white British. Others said they were born here, spent all their lives here, went to British schools and universities, but considered their South American origins as more important for their lives and therefore ticked other mixed. Or their parents or even grandparents came from another country, which is why they have to tick, for example, Asian or Asian British. <coughs> Some from Pakistan, someone from Pakistan said she finds it unfair that those people of Pakistani origins who were born here and spent all their life in the UK have to tick the same category like her, although she spent most of her life in Pakistan. Many commented on the very ethnocentric categorization of this scheme, in which white British and white Irish are differentiated as well as three Asian countries, but the entire African continent is put into one category as well as all other white people. As one participant said, I think pretty much everyone in my team is white. However, in that team, we have one Australian, a Greek, two French, a Serbian, a German, and then a mix of British. And who's to say there isn't a differentiation into British, Welsh, Scottish, and Irish? Ethnic categories are another example of fixed categories widely used in surveys on the basis of the assumption that they enable accurate data collection. But they do not allow researchers and practitioners to get to know what people actually want to express by choosing a particular answer category. I've also asked what people generally think of ethnicity categories in surveys and asked them what they think are the positive and the negative aspects of them and what they think should be changed. Here are some examples of the positive aspects mentioned by participants. It's quick to categorize, it helps to distinguish. It gives statisticians and policy makers useful data. I feel it to be positive. It provides a useful insight in how people perceive themselves and recognizes the cultural diversity within our society. In a medical setting, this query makes sense. Also in some research where ethnicity might be relevant in research in the research topic. Another one wrote, they can help to counter discrimination and the further one said, I appreciate that for equality and diversity monitoring, it's useful to know that as the ethnicity of the respondent, as they're experienced as a raised individual, may have an impact on their responses. It's good to give respect to people's racial and cultural identities. A further one wrote, I'm positive, because by recording this information, one can begin to judge whether biases take place in recruitment. And finally, we could learn more about the ethnicity and debunk stereotypes it promotes multiculturalism. Now some examples of negative aspects participants mentioned. I detest <laughs> ethnicity categories. They are universally antiquated and I sincerely question what actual benefit they bring other than enabling codification for monitoring. I never know how this information is being used. Therefore, I'm highly skeptical regarding the efficacy of such measures or values. Another one wrote, I think most ethnicities are not mentioned and it hurts an individual to have not been treated with due respect. I often find myself placed in other and it's not a good place to be. Another one wrote, slightly uncomfortable as it does not always feel relevant. I can feel both, too per it can feel both too personal and also that it highlights differences. It can be misleading also in the sense that most of us have mixed genetics that we are aware of. Ultimately, as we mix more, 
it seems not a very useful way of categorizing people. And another person wrote, asking someone to label themselves in this way is divisive. People born in the UK who identify as British are asked to take boxes indicating they are more Asian or African than British. It's easy to tick white British without a thought. It's harder to think, am I Asian? For many surveys, these details are demanded for no apparent reason. Applying for local government jobs, I was now asked my sexuality too. I think the reasons for this kind of monitoring need to be thoroughly justified by the person asking the question. Do the answers make any difference to the data provided? If not, why ask for this question, for this information? And then I asked participants what they think should be made differently. And they wrote, give respondents a black box and invite them to fill in. Make the positive aspects of the data clearer. In other words, perhaps the mixed category will need to become broader in future, as more and more people are mixed in their heritage, often several generations back. A further one wrote, the list of categories could be endless, maybe a text box for people to fill in, but then it would be hard to, peep, to group people when analyzing results. It's tricky to get enough information. Have people feel they are included and have the data usable at the end? And another one wrote, make it anonymous or simplify the whole process. I understand we have different skin colors in the world, but then aim for a statistical solution rather than a stereotypical one where a person has to define everything with something that they might not identify themselves with. Even for me, white other is a strangely way of saying white. Why is it other? Just because I'm not from the UK and I'm not British? If otherwise def other white defines all white people in the world, then black should define all black people in the world as well. Sometimes less is more. And then I asked participants about what they think about personality questions in general. And again, what positive and negative aspects they are considering. So positive aspects, participants mentioned, where they are fun and provide a nice discussion topic with friends. The questions they ask give food for thought, help people reflect on their own thought processes and increase awareness of oneself. Another road, you can get to consider how you would behave in a situation and therefore put abstract ideas into a concrete format, which help you evaluate yourself. When you want to understand yourself or others, better than you can help, then they can help you to organize your thoughts. Others wrote, prompts one to consider own belief and assumptions about one's personality. Another wrote, they can be, be fun and informative, if not taken too seriously. They might be useful when assessing someone's suitability for a job, which requires clear personality traits. A further one wrote, they can find out how good humans are at making terrible judgments from a picture. This is why dating websites like Tinder are a fail. <laughs> and another one wrote, makes you realize that sometimes we mis misjudge people depending on their looks. And finally, I asked participants what the negative aspects are that they see in personality questionnaires. They are not very good because we introduce our own biases. They are too subjective. I always wonder how much your current mood affects your answers when completing these questionnaires. It is quite a subjective area and depends on the person who is taking the questionnaire. Another wrote, they often pigeonhole people. I always find myself on the edge of different types and I act differently depending on if I feel threatened or comfortable with whom I am about. Another wrote, can make people a bit self-obsessed and can be misused to create in-groups and out-groups. Another said, many people do not understand the science of personality testing and could take these tests as a method for clinically diagnosing themselves, leading them to believe there is something wrong with them. Another wrote, not to be taken seriously, too broad to really indicate much of substance. A further one said, too limited in scope and unable to tell the full picture of what a person is like. Another said, I wonder if I'm being led to confirm some theory that I do not think is true. Others wrote, the main issue with personality questionnaires is the statements that are within it. Statements tend to be too general and without any hint of a context or situation. And this provides a problem 
whereby an individual can interpret the statements in a number of different ways, which I feel would not be reliable. People generally have an image of themselves in mind and thus answer accordingly, and often do not provide a true reflection of the individual. Answers may change based on the mood and most recent experience of the individual at the time of taking the test. Personality is best gauged by monitoring the behavior of the subject when they themselves are unaware they are being observed and over a period of time. A test only provides a snapshot. This subject's most recent experiences will come, first, come to mind first. These and many other comments, but in these and many other comments, participants expressed in their own views many of the scientific concerns that I have about personality questionnaires and that, have, that I have been exploring for many years already. They showed that many raters are fully aware that judgments of personality reflect only a snapshot of the idea they had about the target mo person at a given moment and that their judgment depends on their own context and the, in the context in which they got to know the target person. This contrasts with many scientists and practitioners' beliefs that personality qu questionnaires provide an accurate assessment of the how the person really is, which is why they are used to make decisions about people, such as in their careers. I have shown subtle pathways in which stereotypical beliefs that we all have can influence our judgments of others with and without our intention, because we sometimes tend to focus on different pieces of, ev of the evidence available, because we weigh this diff evidence differently, and because we also tend to interpret the personality terms differently, depending upon the gender and ethnicity of the person under judgment. Thus, ratings reflect not only aspects of the target person, but are profoundly influenced by the rater's beliefs about people, many of which have only little to do with the target person's personality and are highly context dependent. I have shown how complex the effects of such biases can be for all of us, whether we are members of a particular minority or majority group. These findings I presented tonight are of particular importance for organizations concerned with monitoring issues of equality and diversity in personal selection and development, where personality questionnaires and ethnicity categories are widely used. These survey tools are considered to be efficient means of standardized inquiry that enable accurate comparisons between individuals, but they, they prevent the emergence of neither intentional nor unintentional biases. And moreover and importantly, they do not reveal the complex reality of the diversity among people that they are supposed to capture. Thank you very much for your attention. So, Jana, thank you very much. Um, so, I'm now going to open up the floor to questions. I, in, in order so that people can get as many questions in as possible, I'm going to take questions about three at a time. So, if you could raise your hand and I'll call out, and then there'll be people walking around with roving mics. So, if you just wait until a mic arrives. So, um, in the middle with a white scarf. So, I'm going to identify you by what you're wearing. So, it's always good to wear something bright. So, in the front, excuse me, so down here in the front, if you could just wave your hand. Uh, thank you for a first question. Uh, any other questions? If you just stick your hand up now and I can get the roving mic to you there. So there'll be, thank you. you'll, be num you'll, you'll be number uh, two. Florentina okay. Taylor from Equality Challenge Unit. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Mark, two quick questions. Sorry if I missed this. Uh, the sample size, so how many participants did you have? Yeah. And the other question, whether you identified any statistically significant interactions with the participants' own gender uh, and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. And then a question just behind, if you could wave your hand. Thank you. Hi. Um, it's Christina Easton. I'm a PhD student at LSE. Um, I just wondered what you thought about uh, student evaluation of teaching surveys and their use in the teaching excellence framework. Um, so it's a different situation from in your study because people have spent eight weeks. Um, and I wondered if that's still if things like gender still affected the outcomes of such surveys. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. OK, good couple of questions to get you going there. Yes, first to the sample size. Sorry, I forgot about that. In the video study, there were 80 participants, and in the online study, 120. So altogether, 200 participants. 
the interaction between the participants' own ethnicity and their judgments of the others would be highly interesting to study. But the sample sizes did not allow to make these judgments because for every, for the videos there were 20 people per video and for the photos 30 people per video. And as you've seen, most of the participants were white British or white other. So I would interpret the data as reflecting the more the views of these people without being able to analyze that specifically. It would be highly interesting, as I have said, to study um, more homogeneous groups of participants and compare their views. And I assume there may be differences or they may have hold similar views. But because, as I've shown, there are social cultural influences of how we see people, it, I, I also assume that there could be different views on these four different target persons. For example, if you have just white, black women, it would be interesting to con compare that. And there was another question. Yeah, uh, teaching questionnaires. Teaching questionnaires. I mean, I'm, I'm, my, my research, I generally deal with questionnaires. Personality is one specific topic, but I also work with that methodologically. And the basic problems occur in these judgments as well, because people may differ in how they interpret the questions and in what anchor points they said. So what does mean, um, what, what, what does um, a very good teacher mean? Um, on, on the scale and it may be that they uh, judge and interpret the items differently if the teacher is male or female um, as I have shown for the personality judgments here in, in the videos. So unless we study how students actually understand these items we do not, we, we cannot say whether there are influences of gender and ethnicity in the judgments of teachers and also in the student satisfaction. I mean people from different background may have different expectations and may therefore interpret these, these questions differently. So I think there is room for improvement to first clarify what, what, what our students understand by that or to introduce a definition of that. But with questionnaires, the general problem is that um, we, we try to achieve too much at once and therefore the, the questions are often very abstract and that's what the participants also mentioned in, in their comments. Um, by using these abstract comments, we try to get a lot of data quickly but they leave, they leave so much room for interpretation that we at the end don't really know what participants had in mind. And this would mean in turn we use more specific questions, but then there would be more questions. So it's a trade-off. But I think it is important that we know what people had in mind when ticking a particular box, whatever the questionnaire is about. Yeah. We could go on and know a lot about that particular topic. Um, so at the back, Thank you. And then further at the back as well, I'll take those two questions. Hi, Olivia, um, Capital Markets, Think Tank, New Financial. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, you mentioned some of the participants commented that they were uncertain when it came to ethnicity questionnaires, what um, the information, they were sort of concerned around what the data was being used for. <laughs> Um, and I, I don't know whether you work with um, companies, but if you do, um, whether you know any individual, any organisations that have particularly good communication strategies around um, their ethnicity questionnaires, so um, or their their employee questionnaires. So why we're we using this data, yeah. and, and and if not, if you know anyone who works in that area. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And then this person at the back, thank you. Um, I'm Imran from Anthropology Department, a master's student. Uh, probably this was this was not part of uh, this was not part of the scope of your study. But I was wondering how these uh, stereotypical perceptions influence the behavior of uh, different categories of people. For example, if the general stereotype perception about the black man is that you know he is not very sociable. Does it, uh, you know, eventually influence the behavior of the uh, black people because they would know from s their experience of social interaction, the society that they are somehow perceived to be less sociable. So, does it eventually influence their behavior? Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we'll take those two, and I'll yeah. call on you for the next. Yeah. Time. Thank you for these interesting questions. So the first is, of course, some some organizations communicate clearly. Um, what the data are used for. I have asked all the video participants, are you always aware when you are asked to fill in what the data are being used for? And a few said, well, I just trust them in the UK, we do that. But many others said, no, actually, I do not. And especially when it's about job applications, people were always concerned. Um, what are they, what, what, what will these data be used for? Will it influence the select, my selection? 
And um, some organizations are better than others in communicating that the data will be kept separate. But many expressed worries that they were not really sure even if organizations had communicated that. So, pardon? Do you have a percentage or a rough idea? Uh, I don't have it in my mind now, but it was, um, I would say about 90% if I don't, uh, um, said I'm not always, I don't always feel well informed about what the data are used for. And also what, what many said, it just has become a habit also for students, they are asked to just add the, the ethnicity dimension to that, then you have some, some data to analyze. And that's what participants often say, really think about, is it always necessary? And also for job interviews, one uh, participant was a black woman and she said, I've been in a company run by a black man and this question never came up, it wasn't needed and the company functioned well, we were heterogeneous and there was no necessi necessity to, uh, to collect these data. And another one said, if you want to use them, fine, but ask me after I have been selected for a job interview or after I have been selected for a job, but not before. So there were different ideas. I mean, we know that um, some companies want to monitor if in this first selection round participants, um, um, job applicants are considered equally from different um, ethnic minorities. But people do have these concerns. I think there is no ideal solutions, but I think we have to take these concerns serious. That many have the clear impression they don't feel well informed about what's going to happen with these data. And in addition to the problems to fit in, unless you're white British, into one of these categories. And the other question was about? Is this about the, how, these, um, how these stereotypical perceptions yes. about different people influence their behavior? Yes. I had one very interesting interview with a black woman about the black man. And she said, how can he behave like this, knowing that in this society, such behaviors for black men are sanctioned? I mean, what a, what a complex thought process about what she thinks that he should know about how their ethnicity should, should behave and then to, to adjust her judgment. And she said, I find him quite stupid that he doesn't consider this. I mean, why does he have to consider it? So there are very complex interactions between what we know the stereotype is, how it affects individuals, and others react differently to it and say, I know it's a stereotype, but I go my way. And um, so it always depends on the context. And I think it's also our own decision how far we let stereotypes go and influence our lives. That's amazing. Uh, so a person down in the front here, thank you if you could yes. wave your arm, and then you just behind. I feel I'm missing out a segment. I'll, I'm going over there next time. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I'm a medical doctor and a lawyer, and I've lived here 36 years. And I know all about COVID, <laughs> racism in the NHS as a hospital doctor. But could you please tell us the experience of the consequences of that stereotypical perceptions of names only? Can I, can I clarify what I mean? A few years ago, St. George's Medical School in South London was accidentally found to have programmed their computers, applications from students, to reject students with foreign names. It was quite a scandal, and they went around and interviewed St. Mary's Medical School, and there the, 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 the comment was, yeah, but we have the same experience. We don't find uh, uh, black people that academically mm -hmm. inclined. And then in Holland, they have found persistently Government research has 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 uh, confirmed Moroccan young man highest amount of of unemployed young people 85 percent unemployed because their names they get rejected not chosen their CV might be far better they're higher qualified higher educated more experienced not one of them is ever chosen for the job. And we had a Nigerian girl here last year, 120 applications sent as a new graduate, never shortlisted. Then she changed her name and she had five um, uh, interviews. Yeah. Could you comment on, on that perception of name only mm -hmm. uh, 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 discrimination and bias? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I'll just take two at a time, so quite complex questions. And obviously you used a neutral uh, name, I noticed, that could be both male and female in the video. Yeah, so it was yeah. always Ashley, yes, which is obviously... Just one name. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm Portia Roloff, so I work in the Department of International Development. Um, and I actually participated in the research. Um, and I was wondering if you think that this research uh, is evidence that 
we should stop using this like deficit model when we try and resolve discrimination. So I'm thinking of the idea of, uh, as, a, as a woman, I'm often offered training to make me more assertive or better at offering, asking for pay rises. Um, and this suggests that actually it's not my behavior that's different necessarily, but how behavior is judged according to gender and es ethnicity. So do you think that this leads to some conclusions of uh, how discrimination should be addressed? Yeah. Okay. So, for the first questions, yeah, um, there are numerous studies around the globe showing that people's names, be it <coughs> names that indicate a specific ethnic origin or male and female, have a profound influence on how they are selected for job interviews. And exactly as you described, even with higher qualification, people in the majority group are selected. And the reason is also what you, what you described. We want to be amongst ourselves and we think we can trust others better who are in our in-group. That's a natural tendency, but we have to overcome that and to discuss that because in our in multicultural societies this just doesn't function. But this is one of the basic motives that drive people to select people who are similar to themselves because they think they can better judge them. So do you think it would help as in Holland they have, have suggested, social workers and career advisors have suggested, they make the applications anonymous, no name on yeah, it. Yeah. No name, no age, just the CV without the name and without the age. Yeah, I think this could, this could help in the selection state, but as soon as the interview appears, I mean, there are a lot of reports when people, um, for example, Muslim women came with their scarf and then they were not taken. I mean, the job decision for the job is made after the interview. So this may help them to move on in the process, but whether it really affects um, their selection for a job um, I, I don't really think so. So we have to change our stereotypical beliefs and have to think about how we can involve people and, and overcome these biases that selection committees have. Thank you. Okay, and then the deficit model. What is uh, the deficit? So, uh, so the question about the deficit model, so uh, in relation to how people are treated, that actually yes. it's the, it's the women, women who need assertive training uh, because they're, they're deficient rather than recognizing the qualities that they have as being positive qualities. Is that to reinterpret? Yeah, <laughs> there are international also, internationally also different policies of how to promote women. And in the um, Scandinavian countries, they have made good experiences with just fixing a specific rate of, of, of percentages of, of women who have to be in certain positions. And in other countries, this is strongly opposed. But um, the experiences that the Scandinavian countries have made are actually very positive because once the um, selection committees, once the um, top management is more mixed, then this will be maintained. So I think the only way to, to move on is to, to work in, in these fields and also to promote women, in, for example, in science, to help them overcome some, some stereotypical, um, some, some inequalities they, they encounter and also for black people. Um, the important thing is to talk about that, to make this a topic, and then to, uh, to be creative and also assertive in implementing <coughs> trainings and implementing better opportunities for black ethnic minorities, people and women. Okay. Yes, thank you. Question in the middle. Uh, hi, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, you seem to be um, arguing against the kind of epithet culture of identity politics. And um, based on that, um, to what extent does context come in? For example, in, um, in, in ancient Rome, um, women were sold as property, and that, that's bound to affect how they behave, how they, how they interact, and men are more dominant, men have all the power, and that's bound to affect how they interact. So to what extent does, does context come into it, and to what extent is that more important to look at uh, than, than identity politics? Oh, that's a big question, I'll leave you to answer that one yeah, more yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for this question. Um, context generally please, plays an enormous role, not only for the ethnical issues, but also for, for gender, for personality um, assessments and so on. And that's something that we do in science, we tend to abstract too quickly, already in the data collection. And in my interviews, I have um, gotten to know that people have a very rich knowledge about in which context, what kind of person should behave like this or when it is appropriate. For example, in the interactions with Leone, with his staff member, is she, she's a woman, is she the same age, is she older, is she younger? All this played a role in how people judged Ashley. 
So in everyday life, we do have all these contextual information in our minds, and they are important. And we know precisely in which context specific behaviors are appropriate and which not. But in collecting the data, because that's what we do in science, we abstract from reality. But I think we abstract too early already during the data collection. And we do not allow people who contribute these data to express all these context uh, sensitivities and context dependence. And it would be our task as scientists to abstract thereafter, after having collected all these context specific and context dependencies, uh, to abstract them thereafter. But this is, of course, more work. It means an enormous explosion of data if we would now consider all kinds of personality characteristics in all kinds of situations. But that's what's going on in everyday life. And we cannot just um, ignore that by using very abstract um, words to describe people and their ethnicity or their personality and then think we have captured reality. We don't. And a lot of information goes lost in that way. Mm. That's true. Um, another question. Yes, thank you. In the middle, if you wave your, wave your arm so you're clearly visible to microphone bearers. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk, uh, Dan Robertson. Uh, so I work with many global employers uh, around issues of diversity and inclusion. I suppose what I'm interested in is a couple of things. There's a lots of debates at the moment around uh, diversity training. And I think the evidence on the impact of training is quite mixed, actually. Uh, some studies suggest that it has some positive impact. Some studies suggest that when it's done in the wrong way, it can have quite a negative impact. I guess in terms of anything that you found, what I'm interested in is bias mitigation. So is there any advice or any evidence which suggests that we can learn to mitigate some of the stereotypes that we see, particularly around performance evaluations and people that move up the pipeline? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very complex question because, as you said, the evidence is very mixed. Trainings are developed everywhere with good intentions. In many cases, they are documented and they have good effects, but in others, they were not documented at all, and sometimes they even had negative effects. So what I could see from my research is that we think about how we evaluate that and what kind of information are we discussing in these trainings. So. I think we should go again on a more specific, context-specific level to make sure that we are talking about the same things. Because mostly we talk on every very abstract levels about how sociable a person is or, or how kind, kind is a big word. And when everybody has a different understanding of that in mind, while we are discussing it, we are not really talking about the same things. So I believe that um, breaking down these abstract global terms to more specific cues that we actually consider in everyday life could be one step to figure out are we talking about the same things and what are we actually paying attention to which causes stereotypical biases to occur in various occupational settings. Okay. Um, any, more, any further questions? Yes, so a cluster over here, thank you. So yes, the person in the front with the blue shirt, thank you. Um, uh, th thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. Um, um, I do appreciate that you are primarily um, coming from a psychological perspective and the study, study that you focused on was done using some sort of social science uh, methodologies that uh, are commensurate with psychology. Um, but I, I was a little bit disappointed, to be honest, um, that um, um, there wasn't um, some sort of further consideration of other perspectives beyond psychology in trying to understand the um, racial um, stereotyping of personality and the gender stereotyping of personality. Um, I myself feel that a more multidisciplinary approach might have been much more informative, one that looks, for example, at the role that the mass media plays in the shaping of prejudice around um, pers you know, stereotyping. Also one that looks at um, notions of cultural hierarchy, um, the politics of race and, and xenophobia, and perspectives around social and economic um, um, inequality. There was one just behind, so let's take that. That was probably our last question. Thank you. Great. Um, hi, thanks for the talk as well. Um, so you shared with us some of the positive and negative, um, I guess, opinions that the participants had um, in relation to the 
uh, questions around ethnic groupings. Um, and I was wondering whether you could share some of your own thoughts on, on those and whether if that sort of, um, the way that those groupings are done at the moment should change, what should that be? Um, and also with consideration of, I suppose, some global organizations where ethnicity isn't defined in the, the same ways and how ethnicity sort of doesn't necessarily translate that well globally, um, what your views are on that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you very much for opening the, the perspectives of disciplines that could be, could, can and, and should contribute to this. I have focused tonight on the psychological view because I wanted to explore what's going on in people's minds in the moments they make their judgments. And of course, it, this is informed by all the aspects that you have mentioned, the media exposure, in which um, people of different um, gender and ethnicity are presented in particular ways. All this informs our everyday knowledge and this feeds into what people consider in the moments when they make their judgments. And it would have been too broad to consider this, this also tonight, but I fully acknowledge that this is something that is very important because it contributes and builds up our knowledge that we use in the moments when we make a judgment, which is, as somebody has said, context dependent. And also this context dependence is a general knowledge that um, we have acquired in everyday life through various uh, means also, that those that you mentioned. And categorizations. the categorizations of, of on ethnicity. On the yes, um, I think my, my participants that the, the comments, some of the comments I mentioned at the end were very revealing in this regard because many see that the increasingly um, multicultural societies for, for, for these, these categories are outdated and don't, don't function anymore. And if you look around the globe, every country has a different set of, of categories and still people migrate and they are still of the same kind somewhere. So depending on when you're in the UK or in Singapore, you have to categorize yourself very differently. And I think what participants clearly said is that they should be improved and should be well updated to, to what people currently think they themselves would categorize themselves. I mean, certainly there will always be a kind of abstraction and generalization and, and finding more abstract categories. But many participants clearly said that the current system does not really match um, and, and, and also the feelings that these categories create in those who have difficulties to fit in. I mean, I had participants who started by saying, oh, I'm afraid I have to tick that box. Mm. I mean, how do, do we make people feel just by presenting these categories when they have to, the first thought is, is, is to say, I'm sorry, I have to take that box. It doesn't really deflect what I am. So I think that would be a first way to, to update what is used globally and also to reconsider what is actually necessary to, to categorize. I found one of what the participants said, every white people, all white people and all black people and what else do we need to know? And an alternative would be also to, to think just about nationality where people were, were born and grew up and where, where they spend most of their lives. What does ethnicity actually contribute in terms of information about who people are? So there are a lot of debates and people are very aware of that. And I think as, as scientists and practitioners, we, we need more information about this and update and update these, the schemes that are being used. And what I, sh I showed was the um, scheme used for the London census. So, and given what participants said, we don't really know who grew up here and who was educated here, socialized here, and those who was not, because we, we forced them to take the same categories. So, so listen, it's fascinating. We have reached eight o'clock, which is um, the end of our time, but it's certainly not the end of what we could be discussing here. I'm sure we could go, we really could go on and on. So, so I want just to um, help you, if you could just share with me or demonstrate your appreciation for Yana um, one more time for just such an excellent talk and a very stimulating evening. Thank you.